I'm going to talk today about the origins of the human imagination, plant-human coevolution, and the role that that might have played uh, in neural development, in the evolution of, in the uh, appearance of cognition in our species, which is something that sets it apart from just about every other organism on the planet, um, uh, sometimes to our detriment. I did want to mention this website here, uh, hefter.org. We're a nonprofit organization in the States that's sponsoring clinical research on psychedelics. We have a couple of uh, FDA-approved protocols using uh, psilocybin to investigate both uh, the mystical experience and the neural science, if you will, of mystical experiences, and then some more medically related uh, protocols involving psilocybin at the end of life, uh, helping patients come to term with their terminal illnesses, uh, and we hope to expand beyond that. But uh, we're in close communication with uh, our Australian uh, counterpart, PRISM, which I think uh, Martin is going to talk about, and uh, that's the nascent program, the nascent organization in Australia that's trying to foster similar type research. So if, you, uh, if you're interested in seeing research in Australia on this go forward, I urge you to go to their website, join them, uh, give them your support in any way you can. There's a fine bunch of neuroscientists, pharmacologists, and other types of nerdy people you know, with passionate interest in this area. So uh, what I want to talk about here for a little bit is uh, plants. And if you think about it, plants are all over the place. We don't pay them much attention. Uh, they're just there. Uh, but they are, when you step back and think about it, how weird they are. <laughs> they're not at all like people. They're not at all like animals. They appear not to do much. They just kind of sit there. Uh, but they actually do a whole lot, the, not the least of which is sustain all life on this planet. Uh, and well, how do they do that? Well, if you look at these interesting uh, plant images, you'll see that although plants are not like people, people can sometimes be like plants. Um, plants do a few things, they do quite a lot of things that animals don't do, and that's what sets them apart uh, in terms of where they fit into, uh, global eco into the global ecologies. And one of the things that plants do, this trick that they've mastered, uh, which nothing else on the planet has, is photosynthesis. And photosynthesis is the ability to take simple elements, carbon dioxide, water, and sunlight, and make complex organic molecules. And uh, this is an essential process in the sustenance of life on the Earth, because this is the way that the biosphere grabs energy out of space in the form of sunlight and enfolds it into the biospheric network of chemical interactions that, you know, that we know as life, that we know as this interconnected biosphere. If there wasn't something that was able to take this energy, it would all go to waste, and it takes energy to run a biosphere. Plants are on the front lines of this. They manage to take things in, take in these elements, and through the miracle of photosynthesis, they can make a vast array of organic compounds, some of which are universal in all living things, and others are not. Others are unique to particular plant families or genera even. They're less restricted. This is just, you know, why don't plants get fat? Because plants are light eaters. And literally, they do eat light. That's what they do. And uh, they play a very important role, as most of you know, in maintaining the balance of greenhouse gases. One of the big impacts on, uh, on uh, you know, carbon dioxide accumulation in the atmosphere contributing to global warming is that we are cutting down rainforests. We're cutting down forests everywhere, but especially in the tropics. And tropical rainforests are responsible, you know, the decimation of the rainforest is responsible for about 30% of global warming. 
So when people say, what can we do about global warming? How about we stop cutting down rainforests? That's step one. It doesn't require any uh, particular new technology. It just requires a new consciousness, which is, of course, the harder part. Um, well, so plants have mastered this trick of photosynthesis. Carbon dioxide, water, and solar energy. And from that, captured by the pigment chlorophyll, the thing in plants, the molecules in plants that make them green, they can feed, in, feed into various biosynthetic cycles, primarily simple sugars to begin with. I'm not going to go through all this, but it just shows you how complex these interconnected biosynthetic pathways are. And the blue ones are more or less what we call primary metabolism. In other words, these are the pathways that lead to the molecules of life, the very stuff of life that we all are made of and that on which life depends. Because if you think about it, every living thing is a biochemical engine, a molecular machine, if you will. Uh, and we depend on the, the molecules that are originated by plants, which we then consume for the sustenance of you know, every, every living thing. Now these yellow boxes are very large categories of what's sometimes called secondary metabolites. They're secondary only in that they are not universal in organisms. They're specifically, uh, they're restricted to specific genera or families. Uh, and so obviously they're not required for life. They're not universal, so life doesn't depend on them but plants make these things and put them to their own uses. And they include things like the nitrogen-containing alkaloids, which are very important in medicine because they're often physiologically active. Things like the phenolics, which include compounds like tannins or flavonoids. Flavonoids give leaves their color after the, uh, after the sap stops running. Uh, many, many, enormous classes, every one of these boxes represents thousands of different kind of structurally different compounds. Or the terpenoids, which give flowers their, uh, their fragrances, the simpler terpenoids, or uh, carotin carotenes, which give uh, fruits their color. These all have functions in the ecosystem. They serve the plant well. And because the plant has mastered photosynthesis, it's it, it literally has energy to burn. I mean, it can make these things. It costs energy in metabolic systems to make compounds, but plants have all the energy they want from sunlight. So they can make these compounds. And why do they do that? They're not essential for life. What is the purpose that these uh, secondary compounds fill? Well, as I mentioned, what they are, they're messenger molecules. This is what plants use these things for. Animals react to their environment through behavior, but plants react to their environment through biosynthesis. Plants substitute biosynthesis for behavior. Animals can flee or fight. That's their behavioral reaction to threats in the environment. Plants can't do that. They speak a language of chemistry. They're usually stuck in one place. So they interact with their environment through these secondary compounds, which have a, a kind of a messenger type function. Uh, all of plants' relations with other organisms in the environment, fungi and bacteria, other plants, uh, microorganisms in the soil, insects, herbivores, and of course humans are all mediated through these plant messenger molecules. Uh, the chemical interactions and relationships between insects and plants are highly developed. By and large, flowering plants require the intervention of an insect in the form of a pollinator to complete their life cycle. So in terms of mammalian reproductive physiology, we can think that would seem kind of kinky. I mean, if we required a, the intervention of another organism to complete our reproduction, we would, that would seem weird. But with plants, it, it's, just, it's just the way it is. So these uh, chemical interactions between plants and insects and coevolution between insects and plant chemistry is highly developed. And 
there are kind of, there are many things they utilize them for, but you can kind of put them into three broad categories. They use these compounds for defense. They can be repellents. They can be a signal to an organism that says, stay away, do not mess with me, do not consume me, do not even come near me. Uh, you know, and these are the toxins. These are, you know, uh, and what's toxic to one organism may be an attractant for another organism. Mostly these compounds have multiple functions, but defense is a big one. And that's, oh yeah, sorry. Sorry, my little mushroom pendant there. Uh, <laughs> Somebody gave me in, uh, in Melbourne, very, very kind of them. Um, so that's often where the role of these alkaloids and these other plant toxins come in. They're basically protective mechanisms uh, for the plant to discourage things from attacking them. Well, another important function is semiosis. Semiosis from the term semaphore, they send a signal. These messages send a signal which may be a defensive signal, a signal that says stay away. It may also be a, a signal that says come here. You know, I want a, of course the plant doesn't really think in these terms, but to encourage a closer interaction uh, between an organism, and the obvious one is an insect pollination where the fragrance of the flowers, the color of the flowers attracts the insect to collect the pollen and the nectar and in turn uh, pollinate the plant. Many other kinds of of you know, come hither signals are also known uh, in the plant kingdom, but that's a semiotic function. And it also often involves symbiosis. Symbiosis is the close association or living together of two different organisms, like an insect and a plant, or like a fungus and a plant. Many plants are, you know, have in their root system, their roots are covered in sheaths of fungi that grow in the soil. These are not pathogenic organisms. These are symbiotic organisms. They help the plant with nutrient absorption. And they might per they get uh, nutrients from the plant uh, because the fungi are not photosynthetic, so they can feed on the sugars and other things made by the plant. But they, in turn, might produce, for example, antibiotics that keep bacteria from infecting those roots. So. Mutual benefit, usually. Symbiosis involves mutual benefit. And this is the most you know, obvious and trivial example is the insect pollinating the flower. That involves just multiple sem semiotic and symbiotic mechanisms that keeps you know, this whole thing going. Um, well, we are not outside of this, this uh, web of chemical relationships. Uh, we often like to think we are, but everything we are and everything we do depends ultimately on plants, uh, just like uh, essentially all organisms in the environment that are not photosynthetic or are able to make their own nutrients from simple compounds are parasites on plants in a sense. We feed on plants. They don't mind that, but well, sometimes they do, and then they produce these repellent compounds. But when it comes to our own nutrition, we are clearly what we eat. And we, it's either we directly eat plants or we eat animals that have eaten plants. And we depend on uh, many plant metabolites for things that, uh, that are important in our own physiology that we couldn't live without. For example, essential fatty acids, as you've heard of essential fatty acids, right? Well, the reason they're essential is because we don't make them. We've forgotten how to make them in the course of evolutionary time. So we have to consume something that does make them, that hasn't forgotten. That may be fish or it may be plants. There are many plant sources of uh, essential fatty acids. Another example are essential amino acids, which are like the aromatic amino acids. We don't make those anymore. We've lost that ability, so we have to eat organisms that do, and those are very important uh, signal transduction molecules in our physiology, including neurotransmitters. Most of the 
important, many of the important neurotransmitters such as serotonin and dopamine and norepinephrine, all of those are products of these essential amino acids by a fairly trivial chemical modification. So consciousness itself depends on plant secondary compounds in the sense that these neurotransmitters regulate many of the brain processes that we think of as supporting consciousness. So we have, from the dawn of evolutionary time, since long before we were anything resembling, you know, the curious monkeys that we are now, we had deep, deep symbio symbiotic relationships with plants. And those have affected our evolution in multiple, multiple ways. And one of the sort of more overt examples of this symbiosis is agriculture. Agriculture is a human invention. It goes back, we're not sure, but it sh started showing up around 12,000 years ago uh, in various parts of the world between 12 and maybe 5,000 years ago. It, it showed up in various parts. And it was a, tr it is probably the most significant uh, event in human evolution and human social development that's ever happened. It changed everything. And it is, a, it is an example of this plant-human symbiosis where both the plants benefit and we have benefited. And we have benefited in kind of obvious ways. It, agriculture fostered a transition from a nomadic hunter-gatherer type life to a sedentary, settled kind of life where we could make complex settlements, we could establish villages and we could reap the benefits of all of those uh, benefits that come from being sedentary. Division of labor, elaboration of social institutions into law, science, art, religion, all of these things really could develop much more elaborate that there may have been primitive sort of proto-structures of these things before there was agriculture, but agriculture is the the, uh, you know, the technology that culture runs on, that enabled culture to really flourish. And, uh, you know, we still depend on it. Uh, and, uh, you know, without it, we'd all starve, I suppose you could say. So uh, agriculture is an obvious example of a deep symbiosis between ourselves and the plant world. And it's a two-way street. Our genetic manipulations of plants, such as our important food plants here, like the Brussels sprout, and or cannabis is another example of a medicinal plant. These are human artifacts now. We have modified them so radically to our purposes. We have selected these plants and domesticated them and we've selected them for properties that we value, taste or color, nutritional properties, medicinal properties, or whatever. In the case of cannabis, as a good example, we have varieties that produce fiber, the cannabis fiber. Hemp is a very important source of textiles and paper. Uh, we select for the oils, the nutritional oils in the seeds, which are, again, many of these essential fatty acids. And, of course, we also select for the psychoactive uh, tetrahydrocannabinols, which you know, have numerous um, medicinal properties as well as psychoactive properties. Um, and you know, if you look back into the archeological record, cannabis was known as a medicine you know, at least since 10,000 years before present. There are archeological sites that have it. Some uh, archeological digs go back 60,000 years where there are hemp seeds and opium seeds and this sort of thing. So humans have had these symbiotic relationships with medicinal plants for a long time. And most of these plants, these domesticated plants, could not exist without us anymore, without this human relationship. You turn these things back into the wild, they couldn't, many of them have lost the ability to reproduce under natural conditions. They require human intervention to reproduce. So, you know, the plants have uh, made this bargain with the devil, as it were. I mean, as long as we maintain the planet and unless we blow it up or toxify it, which we're working on, uh, 
But as long as that doesn't happen, these plants have a kind of evolutionary free ride. They're removed from the vicissitudes and the hazards of natural selection. Now they face the hazards of human selection. And, you know, breeding programs and that sort of thing, all of these kind of modifications came before we had genetic engineering. I mean, plant breeding and, and plant selection for desirable traits is a kind of genetic engineering. But now we've taken that to the next step and we can transfer genes uh, between plants in ways that would never ever occur in, uh, in nature. Uh, so it's the intervention of intelligence uh, into the evolution of these plants, or sometimes it's the intervention of stupidity into the evolution of these plants. You know, it's not always a good thing. Um, well, plant secondary compounds have also had a tremendous, you know, it's a, it's a two-way street, and plant secondary compounds have affected human evolution too, mostly through dietary exposure to some of these, some of these compounds. So, Secondary compounds in plants lead to naturally occurring toxins, lead to human dietary exposure. From that, there result direct effects on the phenotype. Most of you are, you probably know what the phenotype is. It's kind of the, the expression of a genetic complement. It's what we see. It's what you see when the, when the genome is expressed and, and uh, react, mo reacts directly and it has environmental effects. And within the phenotypic effects, there are behavioral adaptations, such as detoxification techniques, figuring out how to consume plants that would normally be toxic. But we have, we're very clever, and we figured out ways around this. Things as simple as peeling and cooking and uh, you know, processing them in that way. Well, this seems trivial to us, but when these technologies, which is really what they are, were discovered back in the day, these were breakthroughs because they allowed herbivores to expand their, you know, omnivores, which is what we are, to expand their dietary choices. That was very beneficial for these populations, often, you know, uh, where nutri nutritional plants were a rarity. Uh, another behavioral uh, and physiological mechanism that's phenotypic are uh, recognition and avoidance strategies. We learn to recognize plants that are good for us or for some reason we are attracted to uh, and stay away from plants that might potentially be toxic. Again, this is a behavioral adaptation. This is a learned uh, body of knowledge to, to know what to avoid. Uh, our body itself is programmed to reject toxic plants through functions like vomiting and diarrhea. You know, it has its own protective mechanisms, which often are a reflection of this plant-human coevolution uh, and adaptation. And this, these two things together lead to activation of physiological mechanisms involving usually the gut and the endocrine system. And then on the uh, genetic side, plant secondary compounds from the diet have direct effects on the genome as well. There is a feedback mechanism that leads to changes in gene expression based on the chemical signals coming in. Uh, we are all biochemical individuals. We're immersed in a chemical ecology, and if you can think of the biosphere as just a, you're a, a soup of chemicals, which is really what it is, but more like a cell where there are all these signals passing back and forth. What goes on in the cell or in a human body or in any body, you can extend to the entire global biosphere. You can think of that as a chemical system. And sometimes this is spoken of as a chemical ecology. So that if a population, for example, in some valley over here is exposed to a toxin, the liver enzymes that metabolize and detoxify that compound are inducible. The genetic capacity to create them is there, but they're only produced when called upon, and that's the environmental exposure that activates that signal, and that population is, uh, you know, is then adapted to that chemical. They can, you know, they can safely consume that plant, whereas someone 
outside of that ecology would have to adapt first before they could you know, safely consume it. I guess the most trivial example of this is alcohol. Uh, alcohol dehydrogenase is an enzyme in the liver that detoxifies ethanol. Some people who are used to drinking a lot have high levels of this in their liver, so they can consume you know, many, many beverages while perhaps their companion across the table is being literally drunk under the table because they don't have the tolerance for it. I'm not saying that you should necessarily drink lots of alcohol so that you know, you're adapted to this, but this is one um, idea. Um, so the molecular changes based on feedback from our environment lead to the induction of enzymes, inducible enzymes, and hormone responses and this sort of thing uh, is what makes us each a unique biochemical individual and allows us to adapt to our chemical ecology, our particular unique chemical ecology. We don't all eat the same things. We're not, not exposed to the same chemicals over the course of time. So if you do, you know, if you look at the different enzymes profi profiles of, for example, what's in your liver, you'll see that everybody is, is unique. Everyone is an individual. Medicine is only beginning to wake up to this. And the idea of individualized therapies for cancer and this kind of thing is now a hot topic in medicine. But chemical ecologists have known this for a long time. So these processes, these two processes, lead to variations in diverse metabolic processes that have uh, effects on individuals and populations, such as modifications of disease susceptibility. If a population, for example, is customarily consuming a plant that has immune stimulating properties, chances are that population is going to have less susceptibility to disease, so they have a evolutionary advantage over a neighboring population where perhaps that plant doesn't occur or they don't consume it. So that leads to evolutionary consequences leads to changes in individual and group biological fitness, and ultimately genetic drift. Uh, it leads to shifts in the gene frequencies in these populations, uh, affecting differential survival, affecting reproduction rates, and uh, other types of evolutionary consequences. So I guess the, the, the take home lesson from this kind of elaborate diagram is, that plants have modulated and continue to modulate human evolution uh, ever since you know, uh, we have been interacting with them, which is, um, depends on how far you want to go back, but many, many millions of years. So it, it really gets interesting when you talk about neural evolution, when you talk about the evolution of the human brain, uh, as shown in this diagram, which uh, this is not the latest picture, the picture changes about every other week, but this is basically a diagram of neural evolution. This is size of the brain on the bottom axis here in cubic centimeters. The biggest brains are Homo sapiens around 1400 cubic centimeters and uh, going back to around 300. And then these are millions of years on this axis here. So what you see is that within basically a very, very short span of evolutionary time, two million years is a blink of the eye when it comes to evolution. But the human brain, or the hominid brain, I really should say, has basically in doubled or tripled in size in that period. Homo habilis, uh, one of the first sort of generally recognized hominids uh, about two million years ago had maybe, you know, 800 uh, cubic centimeter uh, cranial capacity compared to Homo sapiens uh, almost twice that. Even Neanderthals had even a slightly higher brain uh, volume than did Homo sapiens, but you have to also take into consideration uh, the body size. They usually don't talk about brain size, but they talk about brain-body uh, ratios. Well, so what this slide shows is that there was a relatively rapid uh, development of 
complexity and size of the, of the brain in these hominid lines over recent evolutionary time. And by recent, I mean from about two million years up to 100,000 years or so. By 100,000 years ago, essentially we were neurologically modern humans. Homo sapiens were neurologically modern and we haven't changed that much since that time. I mean, we've continued to change. Well, that's interesting when you consider that complexity. Uh, one of the uh, uh, sort of traits that give the brain its capacity is the fact that it's so complex. It is, in fact, the most complex object in the known universe. And complexity in biology is often associated with, uh, you know, advanced uh, characteristics in a way. Uh, as you know, the brain is a collection of neurons, largely, and other cells that communicate with, with each other through neurotransmitters and through synapses. And uh, it contains more connections than the, the global internet, more connections than all of the computers and routers on the internet, a single brain. Um, the brain contains maybe 100 and 500 trillion synapses. So if we compare that to another complex object, the Milky Way galaxy, the brain wins hands down. The Milky Way galaxy contains only about 100 billion stars. And if each synapse is a star, our brains are equivalent to 1,000 galaxies. So we have right inside our heads this, uh, you know, three pounds of pinkish matter, uh, pinkish gel, that is the most complex object that anyone has yet encountered. And uh, in biology, complexity is often associated with emergent properties. Complex organisms can do a lot more than simple organisms, is the kind of the, the basic, uh, you know, simplistic expression of that. And within that brain, there are neurotransmitters, the, the communication processes that goes on between neurons, between different parts of the brain, are largely mediated by neurotransmitters. So just as plants have messenger molecules that mediate their relationships within the ecology, within our heads, we also depend on these neurotransmitter type molecules, which are often very similar to what you find in plants. In fact, they come from what you find in plants. So that's no real surprise. They're a reflection of this coevolution. By and large, neurotransmitters are relatively small molecules. They mediate this crosstalk of communication between, between the neurons. And uh, they mediate consciousness. All of these interrelated communication, crosstalking, feedback, et cetera, processes uh, are experienced by us as conscious awareness. Uh, it's, uh, it's this network of uh, neurotransmitters and neurons that create this simulation or this experience, whether it's a simulation or really is reality, is up for grabs. But many of these neurotransmitters uh, come directly from plants. Many of them come from the, from the uh, essential amino acids that we were talking about. I think Salvador Dali probably got it right when they asked him, how do you get the ideas for all this crazy surrealistic art you produce? You must be taking drugs. He said, no, I don't take drugs. I am drugs. And if you think about it, that's true. We're biochemical engines. We are made of drugs. The reason that psychoactive drugs have the effects that they do is because they affect the processes that regulate neurotransmitter function in our brains. They affect either the synthesis of those transmitters or the storage or the release or the breakdown or the reuptake of neurotransmitters or quite often they either mimic the effects of neurotransmitters or they block their effects at these synaptic junctions at these crosstalk points. Uh, so, you know, we have this understanding of how neurotransmitters work, and we know that they evolved from the same evolutionary precursors. And probably those functions that in plants served an external, uh, external function in the ecology have been internalized and re repurposed, if you will, 
to serve our own neural signaling in the brain. So what does all this mean? Well, it means that maybe there is something to do with uh, this plant-human interaction has something to do with the evolution of consciousness and the evolution of this extremely complex object that we're totally immersed in all the time. Uh, not such an unreasonable suggestion when you look at the other types of effects that secondary compounds could have uh, on human evolution. Now, if we step back a little bit and look at ourselves, which is hard to do, but if we step back and if we think how different really we are from anything else in the ecosystem, in the environment, we are totally anomalous, human beings, primates, uh, homo sapiens, are the only species in, on Earth that we know of that has a complex language. We're the only species that invents and utilizes complex technologies. We're the only species that's mastered an important trick, which is the ability to store information outside of ourselves and transmit it non-genetically across space and across time through writing and these types of technologies, oral tradition, storytelling, myth, music even. Other species don't really do that. So that sets us apart. And as a result of that, we are immersed in this world of abstractions. We're immersed in this world of ideas. Our ideas and our imagination are every bit as real to us as anything in the physical world that we have to interact with. And so I, I think that sets us apart from humans, from uh, animals, I mean, other animals, which have a certain kind of intelligence, but not this kind, and not developed to this extent. And because we're immersed in this world of ideas, this ocean of abstractions and symbols, that's what human culture runs on. That's the foundation of culture. And culture is, again, a combination, a, an edifice of all of these different subparts, art, science, religion, magic, myth, medicine, technology, folklore, law, all of that. That's all part of culture, and other species don't have those things. Um, and if it weren't for language, we wouldn't have culture either. Language is what runs culture and, and on which these abstractions, these symbols uh, operate. Uh, and if we didn't have these extraordinarily complex brains, we would not have the extraordinarily complex language that is the basis of culture. In fact, neuroanatomists and neuroscientists now know that large parts of the modern human brain, of the neurologically modern human brain, are devoted to the generation or the comprehension of language. Very large parts of the motor cortex, for example, part of the brain that controls movement, probably 70% is devoted simply to the movement of the face and the lips and the muscles in the face. Uh, the rest of it, movement of the arms and legs and these other things is a relatively minor part of the motor cortex. So we've evolutionarily adapted our brains to generate language, and language is what makes culture possible. And once you have culture into the equation, biological evolution kind of takes a back seat. Ever since culture, made possible by agriculture, got rolling, evolution has accelerated, but it's been a cultural acceleration. And now we've gone in a mere 10,000 years from you know the digging stick to, to the spaceship, to the moon rocket, whatever. That's a very short span of time. So at some point in this evolutionary process, consciousness appeared. And it is the one thing, this language and the ability to relate symbols and abstractions to meaningful sounds and images. Uh, appeared and that's really what got things going. How long ago did that happen? We're not sure exactly, but what we have in the archeological record, in the evolutionary record, is evidence of artistic expression. That's the thing that we can look at to say, well, this could not have been made by an unconscious species. It could not have been made by accident. 
So if you go back, way back, to about 300 to 500,000 years ago, half a million years ago, objects like this have been found, which resemble the Venus statues, the, the uh, much more recent late Paleolithic Venus figurines that you've all seen, the women with large breasts and big bellies, obviously pregnant and, and fecund, and their fertility symbols, right? Well, these are primitive by comparison, but unlikely to be um, unlikely to be natural formations. Some have said these are just natural formations that that uh, accidentally uh, resemble these fertility figures. I think that's pretty unlikely, and the fact that humans were making this, or not even us, Homo erectus, not, not modern humans, were probably manufacturing these a half a million years ago, is a sign that they had to be conscious in some form. They had to recognize the, the uh, sort of potency of the idea of reproduction, of fertility. That was a big preoccupation for a species in those days because that was all about the propagation, you know, that was about survival. So these objects, these fertility objects, probably had a great symbolic, religious, and cultural significance for whoever made them. Well, we can flash forward another couple hundred thousand years and we can uh, find in uh, Bombos Cave Blombos Cave in South Africa around 70 to 80,000 years ago, if you dispute that the other uh, ones were actually artifacts of human manufacture, but this, there's no argument here. These ochre blocks are, have been inscribed with uh, geometric designs, which may have been, had calendrical significance, we're not sure, might have had uh, some relationship to uh, abstractions, uh, seen in psychoactive states, the so-called phosphenes behind the eyelids. These, these uh, necklace, these shells have been, uh, had holes punched in them and, and then the sites where they're found were clearly uh, made of, used for necklaces and jewelry. So a species that, for whom these abstractions are that important, that they actually have jewelry, that's an intelligent species. It's hard to argue that they did it. Well, if you start around 80,000 years and then you just go through, you see that this t artistic expression, if artistic expression is an example of the human consciousness, the evolution of consciousness and cognition, you see it happen in different parts of the world. Once, once it got rolling, it suddenly appeared all over the world. There are cave paintings and other types of figurines that are unambiguous evidence that we were a conscious species, that we you know, had a sense of uh, the transcendent, and we express that through artistry. And so you know, there are caves paintings in Argentina going back to 9,000 years before the present. There are the Venus figurines 40,000 years before the present. The, rock paintings in India 30,000 years before the present, uh, and of course the famous cave paintings of Lascaux and other parts of uh, Europe, you know, 17,000 to 40,000 years. So um, this is evidence that this consciousness meme, this artistic cognition meme, once it was expressed in one place, suddenly spread all over the world in a rather rapid uh, fashion. What triggered this? Well, clearly, this is what triggered it, the monolith, right? You've all seen the movie 2001, I hope. If not, go see it, possibly the greatest science fiction movie ever created. But in Stanley Kubrick's 2001, the monolith appears at critical junctions in human evolution and human history. And the monolith is a sort of stand-in symbol for what Rudolf Otto called the Mysterium Tremendum, a mysterious, tremendous mystery. And the monolith, in its role in uh, 
in the movie was just that. It was something that was so alien, so fascinating, so terrifying that we could not look away and we could not look at it. And it was a, a catalyst, essentially, an evolution to draw us forward into greater states of consciousness and greater states of sort of learning and, 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 and yearning, in a certain sense, for this evolutionary transformation into modern humans. It was, it was a teacher, it was a tool, it was terrifying, but it was also critical to the evolution of our consciousness. And in Kubrick's movie, the monolith was uh, something created by aliens that, that came from outside and that you know, intervened in human cultural development, if you will. Well, I argue that you don't have to go to Jupiter to find the equivalent of the monolith. The monolith, the cognitive catalyst, if you will, is already built into nature. And what is that? That is the natural psychedelic compounds, particularly things like psilocybin. Psilocybin is a natural psychedelic that's found in magic mushrooms, as you know, and there are many, many species of magic mushrooms, about 200 different species. They're all over the world, and uh, they would surely have been encountered by early primates who were, remember, herbivores who were hungry a lot of the time and would, would uh, you know, naturally look on something like this that they would stumble upon as, you know, quite succulent and delicious. And in fact, it is. And when they consume it, the connection would be made. Suddenly, the world would open up and the dimensions unsuspected that are just around the corner, corner in, the, in the plants and psychoactive fungi that these populations coexist with in nature would be opened up. And that would be seen as a mysterium tremendum. It would be the first experience of the transcendence of the idea that there was a dimension beyond the dimension of ordinary senses in which the gods, mystery, whatever, um, resided. Now we know that the natural psychedelics, the so-called classical psychedelics, work on the neurotransmitter serotonin primarily, which is the oldest, evolutionarily oldest neurotransmitter, and regulates the functions of consciousness quite uh, dramatically. Sleep, mood, uh, dreams, attention, perception, eating behavior, sexual behavior, all of these things are highly regulated by serotonin, and all of the um, classical psychedelic compounds interact with serotonin, uh, so-called uh, 5-HT2A receptors. Serotonin is also called 5-hydroxytryptamine in the chemical sense. All of the classical psychedelics, LSD, DMT, psilocybin, and so on, are serotonin 2A uh, interacting compounds, and they're known to have profound effects on perception. That's what they're primarily uh, known for, especially on visual perception, as you see here. And if you look at the iconography uh, of their use in shamanism, shamanism is a set, a very archaic set of techniques, essentially for creating and exploring altered states of consciousness. And if you look at the iconography that comes out of that, whether it's a contemporary ayahuasca painting by the visionary artist Martina Hoffman or Huichol yarn paintings, uh, with Huichol is a group of indigenous people in Mexico that use uh, peyote in a sacramental way. Uh, and these are reflections of the experiences, the symbols that are evoked um, by uh, the consumption of these psych psychedelic compounds. And, uh, you know, they're abundant in nature. They're, they're, they're obvious. They're unlike other things in the environment. A, a herbivore, a primate in the environment looking for something good to eat, this is certainly going to come to their attention uh, because they do look good and they're, you know, uh, they're unlike anything else. So again, at some point in evolutionary history, there was an explosion in knowledge of the use of these psychedelics. More recent than 
the cave paintings, although not that recent. Here's, here's the uh, Pasquala cave. This is 4,000 to 6,000 BC, and it may be uh, a little bit older than that, but here are these mushroomic icons in this painting. Not clear that it was, not 100% that it were, they were psychedelic mushrooms, but why would they be there? Or these uh, mushroom stones from Guatemala, 3000 BC, the mushroom shaman, the so-called therianthropic figure containing, made of mushrooms and containing clusters of mushrooms from Algeria, the snuff cults of uh, Peru and uh, Chile and Argentina, which go back at least 5000 BC. So there was again, once this technology was discovered in one part of the world, it quickly spread. For some reason, it seems to be a meme that somehow finds its way through cultural uh, networks and the, the knowledge is shared very quickly. So sometime between maybe 17,000, 20,000 BC and the present, this knowledge of a whole variety of psychoactive plants and fungi was disseminated through the culture. And what were the potential effects from this? Well, as we said before, if it weren't for language, there wouldn't be any human culture. Culture is an artifact, a creation of language. And language depends on this relationship between abstractions, ideas, and signification. Comprehension results from the discovery of meaning, meaning in the relationships between these words, these images, and these symbols. This is what cognition is, signification. And we can't really separate that from consciousness. It's the ability, language is the ability to associate meaningless sounds with meaningful images and symbols. And that, my friends, is synesthesia. Synesthesia is a crosstalk between different sensory modalities. Synesthesia is essentially, if you think about it, the basis of language. If I am up here making a lot of meaning, meaningless sounds, right, hopefully not too meaningless, but I'm making a bunch of sounds that in themselves mean nothing. They're simply small mouth expostulations. But because we're all genetically synesthetic and we're all immersed in this cultural, uh, you know, we participate in this cognitive space, I can make a sound and you can have a meaningful image. And so we understand each other. That's essentially a, a process of synesthesia. In psychedelics, this can manifest in many ways, and it's very common. This is a painting by the Peruvian uh, shaman, Pablo Amaringo, which is called synesthesia. In these states, the images that are drawn forth bring forth uh, a sense of portentousness and transcendence. Uh, so what I'm arguing is that psychedelics essentially worked as neurocognitive programming tools. They functioned as software that enabled our neural hardware, our neurologically modern hardware, to create the hallucination of cultural awareness, the hallucination that we all share, that we call consensual reality. And it's a reality comprised of symbols and abstractions expressed through language in which those things are as real as anything in the external world. So we live inside this cultural cognitive struct, uh, construct, and it may have been the early psychedelics that helped make us aware of this. Another thing that psychedelics tend to do, they work on neural structures um, that are responsible for portentousness, is one term for it. The, the sense of meaning, what some may call the mystical experience or the experience of the transcendence, they actually uh, activate neural circuitry that we now know through studies uh, are involved in mystical experiences and the experience of the transcendence, the experience of significance. And so out of that, one of the things that emerges is religion. And religion is a cultural construct that we have created to deal with our 
tendency, our wondering about the transcendent, about the supernatural world, about our moral claims about how things are, the, the cosmos, human nature, set of rituals and prayer and law and practices, often embodying cultural or ancestral traditions, myth, and personal faith and mystical, mystic uh, experience. Religion occur, refers to both personal practices related to communal faith and to group or cultural practices and communication. Psychedelics are not religion in themselves. They activate religious sensibilities. And it may be that the earliest religious sensibility was as a result of either deliberate or accidental encounters with these natural psychedelics. Well, given the tools that we have now, we can actually use these compounds in the modern context, in a scientific context, to study this process of the religious experience. We can use, for example, psilocybin and uh, neural imaging techniques such as PET to, we can experimentally induce mystical experiences and see what parts of the brain are activated under those states. So we can, for the first time, approach this, you know, the, the most fundamental basis of human cognition and transcendent experience, uh, you know, as a scientific, uh, as a scientific uh, problem to be, to be tested and probed, whether you approve of that or if, whether we ought to be treading in that area is, is up for discussion, but we can certainly do it now. So these tools are important uh, in terms of understanding our consciousness. Uh, another institution that grew out of our relationship to psychedelics and altered states of consciousness is shamanism. Shamanism occurs worldwide now, and it's basically a technology. It's a way, it's a set of techniques and understandings and practices for deliberately inducing altered states of consciousness in trained practitioners who then function as a mediator between the culture and the world of spirits, the other dimensions, uh, you know, the transcendent world that we have this, co this cognitive and religious relationship to. Shamans often use psychoactive plants in their practices, but they don't use them recreationally. It's a very strict, it's a very disciplined kind of learning process. They use other techniques too, such as singing or dancing or meditating. Um, very often animal spirits, animal helpers are very important in shamanic practice. Very often the shaman spirit leaves the body and enters the supernatural world to perform certain tasks, such as to retrieve the soul of an ill person. Illness is often understood as uh, want, uh, the soul of the person has wandered off. The shaman's got to go out there into the other dimensions, into the spiritual realm, and bring it back, bring it home and restore it. So very often in shamanism, curing is a very important function, curing of both individuals and also of the culture. The, the shamans are the conduit for the meaning, the mediates the relationship between the transcendent world and the human everyday world. That is a technique that is found all over the world and it probably started with psychoactive plants, psychoactive fungi. Uh, another important, and perhaps the most important function of the shaman is as a poet, someone who articulates the, the gnosis and the myth of their cultures through their language, through songs and stories. Uh, they are the ones who articulate the cosmic narrative that give the culture meaning. I love this passage from Henry Munn in an essay called Mushrooms of Language. He says, language is an ecstatic activity of signification, intoxicated by the mushrooms, the fluency, the ease, the aptness of expression one becomes capable of are such that one is astounded by the words that issue forth from the contact of the intention of articulation with the matter of experience. The spontaneity the mushrooms liberate is not only perceptual but linguistic. For the shaman, it is as if existence were uttering itself through him, or of course, her. 
in fact, Maria Sabina, many shamans are also women. It's, a, it's an equal opportunity profession. Well, so here we are, you know, we're at the, on the cusp of 2012 and there's a lot of millennial expectations around that. We've been really immersed in this sort of apocalyptic mindset for, you know, at least since the turn of the century, uh, the 20th century into the 21st, we thought Y2K was gonna bring the whole thing down. Well, nothing much happened. But our culture is desperate. Our culture realizes that we are, on a planetary scale, in a very, very critical moment in evolutionary development and cultural development. We're now at a point where the impact of our activities because we are so technological and because we're so thoughtless can bring the whole thing down if we don't learn more or less how to integrate ourselves into nature and how to live with nature rather than exploiting nature. So we're faced with the same conundrum, the same challenge that our ancestors were 15,000 years ago, 100,000 years ago, the question has always been the same. What, who are we as a species? Why are we here? Why are we so different than everything else? And what is our place in nature? We need to understand ourselves and our place in nature. And the psychedelics are as important as tools in coming to grips with that as they were back in the, in the ancient past. So as a culture now and a global culture in crisis and wondering what's next, as a culture preoccupied with the end times and really in some ways gripped by fear and anxiety of where we're going, we know we're at a critical stage, but the question really for us now is which of these mushrooms do we encounter at the end of history? Thank you. Well, it's, it's a tough problem in archaeology, right? Because uh, psychoactive plants, with rare exceptions, are not well preserved. So there's rarely evidence of, uh, uh, you know, the plants themselves, or, or oh, there are often traces. I mean, there have been excavations with the Swiss lake dwellers, for example, where there are traces of uh, opiates in, in pots that were used for cooking, or there's hemp seeds, there are excavations in China uh, that showed that, uh, uh, you know, uh, cannabis was used 10,000 years ago. But these things are relatively recent. Uh, I guess the best evidence is probably the iconog iconographic evidence. Uh, and in that respect, the cave paintings are some of the oldest. Those paintings are thought now to reflect altered states uh, they were, uh, you know, they were a shamanic uh, practice. Uh, uh, they were probably drawn by shamans in, in deep states of, uh, of altered consciousness, um, not necessarily induced by psychoactive plants, but when you look at something like the Pascuala Cave, where, you know, in this, that same ecology to this day, you can, you can go nearby and collect psilocybin mushrooms. They're still growing there. So the short answer is we can't really say, but from about 20,000 years ago to maybe 5,000 years ago in different parts of the world, there's clear evidence based on the iconography. Uh, so it, once it got rolled, maybe it goes back even further, but we just don't have the record for it. So the iconography is probably the strongest evidence and pictures of the plants themselves, the mushrooms or cacti or images that are clearly, you know, hallucinatory types of images with the plant, uh, plant motifs. Uh, so, you know, it's a fascinating area of uh, archeology, span but definitive answers, we don't know. My suspicion is it probably goes back at least 100,000 years. Maybe, there's no reason to think it, that 
you know, that these things were not encountered by, uh, by Homo erectus, by our ancestral predecessors, uh, but we just don't know those answers, which is good, right? I mean, it's not good that we don't know them, but it means we're free to speculate. We're not uh, tied to dreary facts. We can, we can speculate. Well, no, I don't think there is. I think that that's just another iteration of our ingenuity and our technology. I think that we have to respect the cultures in which these substances were originally used, but the fact that we can synthesize them, you know, makes them available as tools to a larger, um, you know, a larger number of people. I don't think that, uh, you know, there's a lot of controversy about kind of the, the cultural role of these uh, substances, these plants and fungi, and is it right to rip them out of their cultural context? And this is, comes up very often with ayahuasca, which is really, you know, originally an indigenous Amazonian practice, now it's worldwide. I think this is inevitable, and I think it's, it's a further expression of the co-evolutionary relationship. We have to take a long-term view of these things. You know, our world is becoming globalized and it's inevitable that, you know, these cultures are going to come together and we're going to borrow or steal, if you will, the religious practices, you know, of these indigenous cultures. It, it's, it's always been so, uh, you know, more uh, sort of Western culture has always exploited indigenous cultures which on the surface can be seen as a bad thing, right? But ultimately, I think you have to look at it in a co-evolutionary sense. This is just another expression. We're looking at a really short slice of time here, but the relationship of the human species to these plants goes back, as we say, tens of thousands, if not 100,000 years ago, and presumably will continue into the future. Uh, they will not, uh, you know, as long as we preserve the planet, even maybe if we destroy the planet, we'll take these things with us if we manage to escape. But I just think this is fine. I think, you know, we're curious monkeys um, and we're very clever. For example, we have figured out how to either extract these compounds or make them in the chemical laboratory. And then we have things like psilocybin, which is very useful for kind of the scientific investigation of, of consciousness. What we as a species have to get straight about is that our cleverness, our moral evolution, our ethical evolution has got to catch up with our technological evolution. So that, you know, with our technological cleverness. So we have these tools, we have to learn how to use them wisely. I think that's why the psychedelics are really so important in our culture. They're a way to learn wisdom and we're still sorely lacking in that area. So anything like that that can help, we should uh, use uh, respectfully and carefully, but we should not neglect it, it's important.